Hey everyone, I'm Chelsea Braystead, Metro columnist with NOLA.com and the Times-Picayune. And we are here um, for another round of happy hour with local politicians. Um, I will let everybody introduce themselves here. I'm Kevin Litton with NOLA.com, Times-Picayune. I'm the uh, city politics reporter. And we are joined by... Stacy Head, city council member at large. Council member Head, you uh, took office in 2006. You were elected to the at-large position in 2012. Uh, you are the longest serving member of the city council currently. <laughs> She's like, don't remind me. <laughs> and you're from St. Helena Parish, grew up kind of around a meet mm -hmm. and moved to New Orleans in 1995. Thank you for being here. Uh, Thank why you. don't you tell us where you are, where, where we are? Um, oh, sure. I, I uh, love this bar. Uh, it was one of the first bars that agreed to be, or chose to be non-smoking, which made it a fan of my uh, friends and and me and my husband, so we really enjoyed it. And also, this was a, um, I think this was a perfect example of what can happen when you have rational zoning rules and you try to encourage development in areas where there isn't development. Magazine Street was um, in District B where uh, every restaurant and every bar wanted to go. If you came, if you were new after Katrina or you're expanding after Katrina, um, you wanted to open a second store, Everybody wanted to go to Magazine Street. That's just where new restaurants went. That's where new bars went. And so uh, some guys came to see me and said, we're really interested in going to Magazine Street. And I said, well, look, you know, most of those places are conditional use. That means that you don't automatically get permission to open a bar. But why don't you go look at this area called Barrett, where the neighborhood got together. I mean, the most amazing people live in this neighborhood. So all of the, um, the people that have been long-term residents in this neighborhood got together, very entrepreneurial, and put together a plan for a an overlay that would be a cultural, um, it's not cultural products, but a, um, an arts and culture overlay that's similar to what was done on Oak Street to make it easier if you wanted to open a bar or restaurant on Verret and if you wanted to have live music on Verret. So what that did was allowed me to talk to people like the Bodenheimers and different people who wanted to come and open on magazine to say, you're going to walk into a buzzsaw if you try to open a bar on magazine. You're going to get resistance. It's going to be difficult. There's a, you know, a lot of stuff going on. Why don't you look at this other area where you can go right in and you will be welcomed by the neighborhood and they will you know, have a party for your opening. And that's what happened. So this neighborhood has been so successful. I mean, I come down for humble bagels. I come down for... <laughs> he loves those bagels. <laughs> those bagels are the best. <laughs> so here we are at Cure. Uh, Happy Hour with NOLA.com is really... It's a chance for um, everyone to get to know our local politicians a little bit better. Um, so we're going to talk about some serious issues and we're going to talk about some fun ones too. Um, if you guys have any questions as you're watching this um, Facebook Live uh, broadcast, um, go ahead and put those into the comment stream below. Um, any questions for the councilwoman, we are going to be asking those. We'll be asking some of our own. Um, my first question is, when you come to Cure, what's your usual drink of choice? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I usually look on their menu. They have uh, fun new drinks all the time. I was here, uh, I don't know, a week ago, and there's something new with tequila and something um, lemony, I don't know. So it's citrus and good. tequila. Yeah, <laughs> I'm partial to a margarita, so something like a margarita. Very good, very good. <laughs> My first question is about your council tenure, and I've only covered you for a year, but you have certainly built a reputation that goes to accountability, good governance, uh, you're highly responsive as far as I've seen, and my question is, you're term limited, you leave the council. How does the next council take on that role? And who becomes the next mm -hmm. Stacy Head? Who becomes the next squeaky wheel? I don't know. I mean, uh, one of the things that bothers me the most about being in politics and working with politicians on all levels is that I, I think people forget what it's like to be the citizen who's just sick of the bare minimum not working. And I have never, despite the fact that I've been in council for 12 years, when people talk about the city council being bad or being lazy or being inefficient or being whatever, I never think they're talking about me. I still think I'm like the citizen going, yeah, they're bad. I mean, today when I was, um, to show you, I mean, this is what I do all day long. Like today, this was my first text of the day to my office. And I'm not going to use the expletives, but um, let's see, where is it? <laughs> She's scrolling through several pages, by the way, yeah. so her first text so was a while is, back. <laughs> so this is a picture of, I'll show you, it's a basically a burned out van on my way to City Hall that I've complained about for <laughs> three and a half, four months. And 
the uh, 311 called it closed because it had apparently been in their imagination moved. So um, I do hope that the new council members that are elected and the ones that come, you know, will, or have already been reelected, um, will try to see through the eyes of a citizen who's just trying to get to work and go around the, uh, you know, the broken down van that's been there for three and a half months. I saw Stacey had email today. I want to read a little bit of a passage from it. <laughs> We're like diving it into the text messages smile. and the emails. And, you know, well, I mean, the thing is, I think everybody should understand, is that if you get an email from Stacey Head, it is going to be direct. It is going to demand something, probably. And in this one, you, you're going after a problem bar. Uh, and <laughs> you, you write, this is no different than if I set up a lemonade stand in the middle of St. Charles, you would remove it. Please remove this illegal mess. And Part of that is in all caps. <laughs> I was yelling. I learned that that means yelling, and I was yelling in that email. Do you get blowback from that? I mean, do you get people that get really angry at you? I mean, you keep doing it, so it seems like you either don't care if you get blowback or... I, 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 I mean, I'm not calling them. I'm just telling them they need to do their job. Uh, you sort of get what you get with me. I, I try to be honest with, you know, or open about um, my positions and try to really hard to be consistent. There is no excuse for... Literally, there is a an alley where a bar has been set up with tables and makeshift stuff um, in an alley. I mean, it's a it's an alley. It's not does not belong to the people who are have set up the bar. Which is a fire exit as well. Well, it's a fire exit. I mean, you got all those other problems in addition to the fact that they've just co-opted. Um, I, I think some of it's public space and also the next door neighbor's space who can't get out of her bar because she there's another lady that owns a bar next door she can't get out of her bar for a fire escape um, and so often when I say this is against the code someone needs to do something the answer I get is well there's nothing we can do we have to take them to adjudication and that's why I wanted to explain the lim lemonade it's really not that much different if I set up a lemonade stand literally in the middle of St. Charles Avenue, the police would come remove my lemonade stand. So I don't know why they don't do that on an illegal bar. We need to go with a sanitation truck, three or four strong people, <laughs> pick everything up, throw it in the back of the truck with the police there, of course, and our problem is solved. They don't have to go through all the, there is no due process requirement. So um, you have had some of your some of your criticisms have been aimed at, at Mayor Mitchell Andrew, and so I wanted to ask you, you know, sort of as, as there's a few months left for both of y'all, um, what would you say uh, Mitchell Andrew is best at? What would you say he's worst at? Well, I, I think all in all, the mayor has been a, Mitch has been a very good mayor. Um, I try to be fair with my criticisms as well as my praise. Um, there's a, it's I continue to believe that. Being in politics and running a government is very much like trying to be a good parent. You know, you re I read every parenting book that I could find when I had first had kids. And um, one of the rules, one of the many rules that I think comes into play is that you shouldn't give people false praise. You, should, you get, shouldn't give your ch children false praise. You shouldn't give them a blue ribbon for everything that they do. You should tell them when they do things, praise them a lot, but also be honest with them when they fail or when they make mistakes. And so I see that with, you know, in our job, I need to be honest with my colleagues and with the administration when I don't agree with them, when I think that they're doing wrong. Um, so that hopefully we can either move closer to what I think is right or, um, you know, at least there'll be a, a respectful dialogue about issues that we, we feel differently about. Now, he has a different philosophy. He believes when you're on the same page with him 90 plus percent of the time, which I really am, 90 plus percent of the time I agree with him, that I should let the other 9% slide or 10% slide. Um, we just, it's a philosophical difference. I think I need to point out those one out of ten times that we disagree and hopefully get to closer to a hundred and, and I think he sees it more as when we're on the same team you should give up the small things that aren't as important. What do you think, you, you've been on council long enough that you had two mayors during your tenure and I think your fights were with the Negan administration, maybe some of the bigger fights. Do you have like a favorite fight? Like the one that you, like that was just your thing and well, you... I was 100% right every single time with them because it wasn't a debatable point. Usually with the mayor, it's an opinion, this mayor, there's an opinion and one of us, you know, we could be both right, we could be both wrong, or we could be sort of right, sort of wrong. With, with Nagin, it wasn't debatable. He absolutely spent money without having invoices, contracts, just would, they would just write checks. That was illegal and I would, we wrote a, was it a, is horrible. It's either five hundred thousand or five million dollars. 
in checks to Big difference. Anthony. I know, but it was so much money back then. We were just spending so many tens of millions of dollars more than we had. Um, Anthony, the IT guy, we literally, we actually, he wrote a check. I think he even signed it. A city of New Orleans check for something we had no contract for. Uh, something having to do with the, with the um, cameras. So those were... Those were more maddening because in the face of absolute, uncontroverted proof that what I was saying was absolutely right, it wasn't debatable, I still lost. <laughs> I mean, ugh. I mean, the FBI then got involved and it worked out okay at the end, but that do you was have nuts. Other, do you have other moments of where you think you were vindicated that highlight? <laughs> do you have like... Can you give me a top one or one or two? With most of the staff members that were, you know, executive staff members that ultimately left, um, I think that Nagan had a woman who, she was so bad at economic development that I, I said, you know, you really deserve an F minus. If that were a grade, you would get an F minus. <laughs> she was dismissed. That was. Um, you know, sales tax, property tax. Most of those things, they're, they're just, you know, not debatable points, but I do think the public is starting to come around to really focusing on them as areas that we need to all admit that we're failing as a city and get it right because this, the two biggest problems, well, three. One is it provides a competitive advantage to people who are cheating. Two is it pushes the tax burden to pay for city services on people who are paying, which is not equitable. And three, when you have an underfunded city, when you have underfunded city coffers, the provision of services first goes to people who need them the most, and that tends to be our poorest population. We are a fairly poor city. So when you can't provide decent city services, it hurts disproportionately people who need the services the most, which is a huge percentage of our citizens. So I want to ask um, our first question from the audience. Um, thank you to Trey Mayweather T. I'm hoping I'm pronouncing all these things correctly. Um, he wants to know what your vision is for New Orleans East. Hmm. Um, New Orleans East has, a, has, I think, three main problems. One is it's got a PR problem that with the right, um, with the right, and I hate to say branding, it's a lot about branding. People don't realize that New Orleans East has some of the most beautiful neighborhoods in the city of New Orleans, that it is five minutes in many of those neighborhoods from waterways that you could go out on a boat, that you can see some of those beautiful marshlands that you have in South Louisiana. So we've got a, a PR problem that we need to figure out how to address, and that has to be done with all the groups that do um, city marketing. Second is we have allowed blight to continue with no excuse. We need bulldozers and greening. There is no reason that we should still have scraggly parking lots all over New Orleans East when they are, they make you look like, when you look at them, you see something that's not there as opposed to the beauty of nature that is all around you. Um, so, you know, reducing the negatives. And then the third is um, in s providing incentives to spur quality development is what needs to happen in the East so that those retail stores will be built in New Orleans East as opposed to Slidell. So New Orleans East, it's a suburb. It's part of the real city, but the feel is a suburb. Most of the people that live there want it to be a quiet suburban type neighborhood. It should be no different than the North Shore 15 years ago, which you know is a beautiful um, bedroom community in many respects with quality retail and pockets of forests in between neighborhoods. But when you drive down the interstate and you see those awful parking lots, the first thing people think of is what is not there rather than the fact that there are beautiful neighborhoods interspersed between um, you know, God's greener. Being a native of Southeast Louisiana as sort of a region, what do you think about is, is the most undersold element of Southeast Louisiana, that it's something that you would tell people that they don't know and oh. that they should know about this region? Well, in New Orleans in general, it is, an, it is an easy place to live, but for the fact that our government doesn't provide basic city services well enough because of just our geography. 
Now, yes, we're getting our streets fixed, which is a good thing, and it's a hassle because it's so hard to get around them, but for all of the construction. Our commutes in New Orleans, most of the time, are not more than about 15 minutes. If you've lived in, in Houston, 35, 45 minutes to get anywhere you wanna go. I love the fact that we are a European city that's built sort of on a grid where you can get just about every, every place you want. You live in Lakeview even. You can hop on the interstate and be downtown. Um, if you live uptown, you've got so much of what you need in your um, neighbor, if, in your um, uptown neighborhood. If you live in New Orleans East, again, you are in more of a bedroom community, but most of New Orleans, the West Bank, you've got um, access to Jefferson Parish. You don't have to go far to, um, to be able to satisfy all your quality of life needs. Now, Louisiana, um, Southeast Louisiana, I go to the lake and think, what a shame that we don't have more opportunities on the lake. Other than driving over the bridges, sometimes I'll go months and months without seeing Lake Pontchartrain. I was just in Austin, Texas, um, and they have really made their lakes part of their community. And we just don't have that in New Orleans, and it's a shame. We need to enjoy our lake better. Uh, we have another... Uh viewer question. Um, this one from uh, Marcy Bladstacker. I'm, again, I'm sorry if I'm like just wrecking people's names here. Um, her question really comes about the sewage and water board. Um, she's had an ongoing, a leak ongoing since 2000, or yeah, 2011, incorrect bills since February. Uh, how, I mean, uh, there's been so much talk about how to fix the sewage and water board, but like really how do we fix the sewage and water board? Sadly, I don't think there is one right answer hopefully the next mayor is going to come up with one of the few right you know one of the few options that we have um, I am nervous about privatizing fundamental government services I think that we have made some big mistakes in the past I don't think that, I think if you look at high functioning cities like Charlotte Charlotte Mecklenburg County is a city that functions very very well they provide high services to their citizens for a low cost um, good quality of life for the people that live there, and they had years past um, taken a lot of the municipal services and uh, given them to third-party contractors because they thought they'd save money, and they ended up doing a 180 and coming back to the position of, okay, no, we need to uh, we need to go back toward um, paying or. Uh, taking care of those fundamental services ourselves. So I'm pretty sure they do municipal trash collection and a lot of the things that we in New Orleans um, have farmed out to third parties. So I'm very nervous about that idea. That said, something dramatic has to happen with the Sewage and Water Board. Uh, when I have spoken to people who have tried to work, and this is whether it's from the mayor's administration who are working there every single day to try to figure out what's going on and how to fix it from third-party contractors who have been hired to come in and, and deal with the sewage and water board, the, there is a culture of dysfunction that is truly unbelievable. And um, it's not, I'm not saying the workers uh, are dysfunctional, it's just the system itself is absolutely antiquated and, and dysfunctional. And it's, you know, it's, it's got to fundamentally change how that happens with civil service, how that happens with trying to hire someone who may not want to come into this hornet's nest. It's going to be hard to find the person to take this job who understands engineering, who understands flood protection, who understands drinking water and sewage systems. That's a tall order. I have a question that's really just a pure political question. Now, I consider you probably, I think you probably consider yourself a conservative Democrat. Um, and you're a conservative de Democrat in a liberal city. But when I covered the city council, I think it was the first meeting after Donald Trump was elected president, I saw what I thought were flashes of anger oh. over that election from <laughs> I you. I cried. <laughs> I cried. What? A lot. I couldn't stop crying <laughs> about two weeks. What, what were your thoughts there, and why do you think that Mr. Trump was successful? And what does it mean to a city like New Orleans to have someone like President Trump in office? Oh, it's horrible all around. There's no place it's any less horrible. He's an embarrassment. He's so embarrassing. We, we um, before he was elected or right when he was, no, after he was elected, we went, my family went to Guadalupe, which is a little French island, 
And um, I told my family, I said, now make sure you stay here from Canada. <laughs> I don't want anybody to know that we're from the United States. I was so embarrassed. I said, let's get some flags, little um, maple leaves, and wear them on our shirts. Tell them we're from Canada. Because nobody would believe we'd actually elect the guy. Oh. What does it say about our politics, do oh, you think? Oh, goodness. Well, I mean, so many people have analyzed it and written it. I mean, it, the Democratic Party, we got what we deserved. We have a dysfunctional party. The, the Republicans got what they deserved, and the Democrats got what they deserved. The Republicans have a party that is splintered into the farthest, rabid, anti-everything that middle America believes in, and the Democrats have done the same thing. And so it's which crazy is going to be more powerful at the moment. Those, both parties have largely left people who are not um, idealistically rigid on a particular issue completely behind. So where does that leave you as kind of your political future? I mean, you're, you're term limited. Is, are there other I things that you want to do? <laughs> do you want to run <laughs> for office point, again? No. Um, I don't know. I, 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 I don't see it in the near future. Certainly not until my kids are, um, are out of high school. Uh, they don't need a mom with in a fishbowl. They're old enough now to know. They were little before, and it didn't matter because they didn't take advantage of it. <laughs> well, they didn't know. They didn't. They 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 lived in a little world where. One time, my son got he, he got his first was it Instagram account or something, and somebody put something ugly on it about me, and so then he responded, and it was it was like, oh, it's time for me to leave office, because he says you don't know my mom is really good. And, so I couldn't have teenagers and, um, and be in office. That would be too hard because my children would take up for me. And <laughs> so it sounds like it's not, it was not a hard decision not to No, no run it's, again it's for time something. to move on. I absolutely believe in term limits. Well, oh, uh, the FBI guy said one of the reasons that we have so much corruption and dysfunction is because we don't have term limits. I, I, think, that's, I think that's part of our problem. Um, we absolutely need to have term limits. and. If I, I, I could have done it for another four years, I guess. I don't think I would have been honest. I wouldn't have been true to myself because I really do think once you serve three terms, it's time for you to move on. Do you think there's a downside to term limits? Oh yeah, of course. Um, you have a, a learning curve in the first at least two years that are, are difficult to overcome. Um, there is a certain, um, I think comfort, you see this in the Senate with being able to do what you think is the right thing and not worry about getting reelected because you are the incumbent and you're more likely to continue to get reelected. But all in all, I, uh, Lindy Boggs did not agree with this. She thought term limits were bad. I think that was one of the few things she was wrong on. I think term limits are good. So, you need fresh blood. Um, looking at, you know, you've got a few months to go before you're, you've, you've hang up your hat on, on city council. Um, what? do you see as your biggest failure? What, what's the thing that you wish that you could have done? I've got a whiteboard that I write all the things I want to get done on it, and I'm not giving up on those yet, so I'm not going to count any of them as a failure. What have I not done on my whiteboard that I'm not going to be able to get done? Panhandling, you're right. I'm not going to be able to deal with that probably. To, to a, I'm probably not going to be able to significantly reduce the illegal behaviors with panhandlers and people who choose to live underneath our bridges. How do you think you could fix that? Well, if you if you so if you were able to <laughs> <laughs> absolutely could fix it. The homeless population advocates say that there is, you know, it's like a pie chart you should, and and the best ex, um, explanation of how to deal with this I ever heard was you treat them like customers. So these are people that you have to serve. So you've got a pie chart of people that you have to serve. You've got a small sliver that just needs a little help and they really are just down and out and you don't need to spend a lot of resources on them. They just need a little ha hand up and they need some help. You've got a large percentage of them who are taking advantage of the situation, choosing to live outside the law, choosing New Orleans because we have open container laws and we have lax enforcement of every single rule and they're just living outside of society and you need to discourage that by making it uncomfortable to choose that life. Then there is the sm very small group in the whole pie of the hardest to deal with, the most challenged, the most um, difficult to deal with people. Many of our homeless advocates, advocates or, or caseworkers can't even get to that population because you're having to get over the people who have chosen to be have fun by living on Esplanade and camping out all day long. They can't actually 
discern the difference between the person who really is needy and needs help and the five other people that have just chosen to move from Portland to San Francisco, then to New Orleans, because it's kind of fun. It's, it, and they'd rather live here, and they'd rather just live outside the margins. So I would discourage the behavior on the ones that we need to get rid of. I would help with a hand up, the easy ones to deal with, and then we'd be able to focus our resources on that smaller group that I do think some of these, you know, some of the the unities and all the groups that, that, that really do that intense case management, they could get to that population a lot easier. We're, I'm a sucker. Um, I may not seem like this, but I'm a total sucker when it comes to when somebody says they're in need. Um, I, met, I forced my staff to help this lady who came up with this incredible story about how she was so down and out, and we went, I mean, beyond, beyond what I think anybody would have expected us to do and pushed unity and pushed unity and told them they were being hateful and they were not being loving to this person and their job is to take care of a homeless person. Well, she was a con artist and unity knew it and they pacified me by giving the woman everything that she wanted and then the next week she was on to another scam and had been Facebooking about her new scam uh, by, by uh, getting Airbnb to give her free places to stay because she said she was a Texas um, she had to evacuate from Texas. So nothing she told us was true. Uh, and so that there's a big group of those people. The guy who had the, um, everybody knows him, that's gone down St. Charles Avenue, the young man who was allegedly there with his um, veteran father who had the leg, that his right leg, he did keep the same leg, that turned in and he couldn't walk and he, was, and he would wear his pants up here. And so he, he would make himself look like he wasn't exactly um, he, his, his mental capacity was a little diminished and he walked really funny. Do y'all know the guy? Everybody knows him. Oh, oh he, was, he was there for years. Of course, Katie knows him. Years. He's back. He's now got long hair. It's kind of, it's like a bob. And he walks just fine and his pants are fine. And now he's looking cool. So I guess it's a new, so there's a huge, huge, huge group of people that are taking advantage of our hospitality that the bad side of that is not just that it's irritating, because it is irritating to people driving to work every day, but people live downtown, people live in Central City, people live in the Lower Garden District, and when people eat and drink, they have to go to the bathroom somewhere, and where do you think they go? They go in somebody else's yard. I wanted to ask about uh, the strip club regulations briefly. The council has come to an agreement on age limits that dancers should be uh, 21 years of age or older. They've come to an agreement on temporary zoning. Do you think that as we go forward, if you're going to adopt new regulations, do you think that there's a opportunity to change course in the direction that the council headed on regulations? Because there's other things that y'all could be doing, and I'm just curious about what the approach would be now, knowing what you know from having gone through this process one time already. I think our path for zoning is, is, is a good one from the zoning side, so that by natural attrition, the number of adult venues will reduce slightly. I think that makes sense from a zoning perspective. From the perspective of whether or not our enforcement is good enough and whether our laws are good enough related to whether to the clothing that they can wear, the number of, um, of, of um, inspections that need to be had, the types of regulation, I am hopeful that the mayor hired someone who has experience looking at, at all manner of regulations related to adult um, venues, uh, live entertainment venues, and he's gonna give us some advice. I think the laws are pretty good. They just haven't been enforced. Can we make them better? I'm sure we can. Can we make them easier to enforce so that it, you know there will be no question that they are constitutional, there's no question that NOPD has the authority and that it, 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 it makes things easier? I am excited to hear from this gent I haven't heard from him yet so I don't know what's going on well that. what do you say to dancers who say this is about shutting down clubs and this is about putting us out of work well it's absolutely not about that I I, I don't think it, again from the zoning perspective um, this is not putting them out if they violate the law and they are punished pretty severely six months in one day they won't be allowed this is about setting regulations on a business that can have some negatives with anything that can have a negative, government's job is to regulate it. Government's job is to make sure that people are safe. 
we have to not go so far that we uh, we deprive people of opportunities to make money and deprive people of their freedoms, but we also have to make sure we recognize when there is a danger, a negative externality from any kind of business, whether it's an environmental toxin or driving a vehicle or that you have to have a CDL because you're driving a, a you know a big truck. We have to have regulations that protect people that are both in the business because sometimes they're not at a they're not in an equal bargaining place with their bosses. So you have to have labor laws because human nature is that the boss may take advantage of you. And you also have to protect the customers. Um, we we've, we've seen many stories, many of which you have written about customers being taken advantage of by people who have um, have worked in and around these establishments. Not the ones, not the, the women who are the men that are um, dancing, but ones who use that environment because it's not carefully regulated to do things that are that are just not okay. So I want to be respectful of everyone's time, so I want to uh, hit some lightning round of questions for you real quick uh, before we wrap everything up. Um, thanks to all of our viewers for sending in their questions, um, and thanks to you both for, for being here. Um, first one is, what is the weirdest constituent request you've ever gotten? Uh, is it goat gate or the snakes? <laughs> Okay. So we have, I just want to be clear, we have goats to choose from and we have snakes to choose from. <laughs> okay. I want to hear the goats. <laughs> the goats. So, um, on the West Bank in a quiet, again, quiet little neighborhood with beautiful big oak trees, kind of Mayberry-ish, there was a man who had, um, who had seven to nine goats. This might be my parents' neighborhood. <laughs> well, it's not, it's not a neighborhood with big uh, yards. It's a very small okay. yard neighborhood. And look, I have no problem with the goats, whatever. <laughs> but he, he had the goats, and he also had a lot of, um, a lot of uh, broken sea dews and, um, and uh, motorcycles and things. And so it was a combination of junkyard that, you know, would gather uh, weeds and grass and, and water and mosquitoes, and then the goats would perch on top of it because <laughs> goats can climb it. And then the goats could get over the fence, and they would scare the neighborhood's dogs because goats are very smart, they're very wily, and they're ornery. So all the neighbors, you know, it said we tried to deal with the goats as long as he stayed in their yard, but they would jump on the sea dews and then jump over and wander down the street. And when people would walk their dogs in the neighborhood, the dogs were hysterically scared and had to run back home, and so people were trapped in their homes because of the goats. <laughs> and um, it, it took a lot of research. It took a lot of letters that are very much my style. Of, <laughs> Seriously, you're not going to do your job and get rid of the goats. Is there all caps involved? <laughs> Many all caps. <laughs> Actually, I, I use all caps rarely because I want to emphasize the words. Uh, but yes, we called it Goat Gate. <laughs> and my uh, sheriff's deputy took pictures on a regular basis, interviewed the neighbors. We had uh, several different enforcement um, entities deal with it. And the goats now live, I think, in Bell Chase on the property it's a, where the man owns some other property where they can freely roam. And <laughs> so go gate solved. Go gate it solved. sounds like the goats are happier. I hope the goods are happy. <laughs> Although they may have enjoyed terrorizing the neighborhood <laughs> poodle, I don't know. So my next uh, lightning round question, um, although I'm glad we took a detour on that one. Uh, favorite song about New Orleans? Uh, oh, New Orleans Lady. Okay, and sidewalk side, neutral ground side. Oh, absolutely neutral ground side. There is no other side. <laughs> <laughs> and then um, our last question comes from Kevin. Yeah, this is a question we ask everyone, and so sorry to put you a little bit on the spot, but we sort of adopted it from a podcast called Serious Eats, where they ask every guest the same question, which is, if you could take any four people to dinner, or any three people to dinner, so it's a table of four, mm -hmm. that are from New Orleans, past or present, living or dead, but they can't be family members, who would you take and where hmm. would you go? Where would I go? Absolutely Commander's for brunch. No question about that. If I could have one place to eat, that's, there's nothing more fun than Commander's brunch. And then who's on your reservation sheet? Um, okay, it's loud in there so, it can be, so they could hear even if they're, yep. even if they're old and, or maybe dead. Yep. Mm -hmm. So we wouldn't have to yell. That's one of the problems with Commander's brunch. You can't hear because I want to talk to these people. Because so right. since this is makeup, we're pretending. You can hear 
and private the room. Brunch. He's got a private room with. Oh us. no, but that's not fun. Okay. And everybody and else is No, fine. but we can say that there's unlimited twenty-five cent martinis as opposed to your limit. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, I adore Leah Chase, and I think she is one of the sassiest ladies in the world. So Leah Chase. Um. Not Lenny Box because I think I would cry because the world was so much more civil when she was in politics. So, not Lindy Boggs. Um, maybe Alan Toussaint. And who would my third be? I don't know. I'm stumped. A bunch popped to mind, but none. Jumps well, we've got three. I mean, Lindy Boggs. Come on, that is. No, a I, I can't do Lindy Boggs because I'll just be Lindy sad. Oh, okay. <laughs> because that was when the world, when you had a, when you had the Olympia Snow types in the Senate. She's a Republican, and then you had the Lindy Boggs. The world was a better place. John Bro. Yeah. No. Now we've got Donald Trump. <laughs> well, we'll put a solid TBA on that third spot. But thank you so much for for, for coming. Kevin, thank you, and thanks to all of our viewers. And we'll be back tomorrow uh, with um, Kristen Gisselson Palmer. We uh, same time, four o'clock. If you guys have any questions, throw them in the comment stream. <laughs>